Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, How to Change Careers. I'm Francine. I'm Alumni Engagement Manager here at King's. And before we delve into today's webinar, I just wanted to remind you that this is part of our How to series, which is specifically created for students and also alumni who are in their early stages of uh, career development. They're also relevant for any alumni who's looking to make a career change. You can find past webinars on our KCL YouTube channel. I'll put the link in the chat later. And you also look out for future how-to series in your monthly e-news. Don't forget that you can use our Kingston Net platform to connect with students and alumni, grow your network, join a mentoring program, and also access your alumni benefits. You can also visit Forever King's Edge, which is your one-stop shop where you can access tailored King's offers and opportunities to skill up and set up from the crowd. Before we start, just a reminder to make use of the Q&A feature of this webinar. You can submit questions throughout the discussion so that the speakers can address them during the Q&A. You can also upvote questions that you want to give priority to. Our webinar today is about how to change careers, where our alumni will share their lived experience with you. You would have seen their bio when registering to this webinar, but just briefly, I'll introduce them. Jack Brown, who obtained an LLB from King's and pursued a commercial law path with Skadden before ending up in an entrepreneurial and startup space. He's now head of corporate transactions at 1.5 in Germany. We also have Rolake Shegan Ojo, who obtained a BSc in infectious diseases and immunobiology, sorry, from King's in 2012, and then an MBBS in 2015. She's now a graphic designer and brand strategist, building refreshing brands with doctors, dentists, and allied healthcare professionals. And last but not least, Mike Wilmot, who joined the British Army before obtaining an MA in military and security from King's in 2021. And he is now Senior Program Manager at Helsing, a security and artificial intelligence company. I will now hand over to our Chair Rolake. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I'd like to dive right in. And so we'll start by asking the panel, what led to starting or to studying a specific subject? And if the career you found after your studies was what you expected? So we'll start with Jack. Could you tell us what influenced your decision to change careers and how you did this? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Rilake. I appreciate that introduction. And thanks as well to, to Francine. Um, so as you can see, my name is Jack Brown. I um, Doing my A-levels in a small market town in the middle of rural um, England, I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do as a, as a career, let alone as a degree. I spent some time um, thinking that it was languages I wanted to do. I really enjoyed connecting with people, um, speaking in their own language and understanding their culture is obviously a very important aspect of really connecting with, with other individuals. Um, and so I, I kind of thought I'd be pursuing a degree in, in um, one of King's many language um, diplomas or degrees and fortunately that changed well fortunately for me that changed I wrote a slew of um, letters to local law firms and to local um, courts because I just kind of thought maybe I'd seen something on tv but I just kind of thought I'd have a little go and 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 find out what that was all about in terms of maybe pursuing a degree in in the law and so I actually had a very fortunate encounter with um, a judge called um, his honor judge Enright um, who allowed me to assist him for a week in uh, Peterborough Crown Court, which is the local Crown Court closest to me. Uh, that really inspired me. And uh, lo and behold, me doing things at the last minute, I decided to completely change my application. And I instead enrolled uh, for a degree at King's in law. So I spent um, four years, part of that in, in Paris, because obviously I continued with my, my languages too. And I, I did my French law aspect in, in, in Paris too. Uh, and I graduated in, in 2013. During my time at King's, I um, felt like I had an incredibly enriching time. I threw myself into all sorts of different initiatives. Uh, I was part of the Pro Bono Society. 
I um, had various roles on the um, Law Society. I had a part-time job to help fund my studies. I had a very active social life. I mean, who, who really can't and who doesn't in, in such a fantastic city as, as London? Uh, very exciting as, as an 18 year old. I'm sure many of you experienced that yourselves um, and really had a fantastic time at King's. Graduated knowing that I wanted to go traveling. That was my ultimate goal at the end of my degree. So I applied really intentionally quite late to um, roles as, as a solicitor in a, in a corporate law firm, knowing that if I had been made an offer, I would still have that year to play with to go traveling. So off I trotted on my year travels. I'd spent many, many hours working in a uh, as a delivery boy at Marks and Spencer's um, to try and save the money to go traveling. Um, and during that year, I received offers for uh, training contracts, which is the two year uh, experience that you need in order to become a, a, a solicitor in, in, England, in England and Wales. Um, and so I was very, very um, fortunate to be able to continue my, my year traveling, knowing that I had a, a career waiting for me. I'd applied to be a lawyer because, you know, I'm sure many of you potentially experienced that, too. When you are amongst a cohort of individuals, you're all studying a similar thing. Um, you can get swept away a little bit. And I unfortunately was part of being swept away. And many of my peers were applying for uh, positions at very prestigious and well known law, large law firms. And I just thought that it was a natural progression and that becoming a lawyer was just the next thing I would do. And indeed, that's what I did. I returned from traveling and I started my training contract at uh, a very large US firm in their London office. Um, very exciting, you know, as a 23, 24 year old to be exposed to that kind of, of a lifestyle. It felt very glamorous. I had lots of travel. Um, I was involved in some fantastic, very strange cases, I must admit. Um, and as part of my training, I positioned myself as someone that didn't want to necessarily go abroad as a part of what you're able to do in, in, in your two year training. But I decided that I wanted to further my experience in an area of law I was particularly interested in. So I basically asked the firm if they would set up a secondment to the Financial Conduct Authority, which is the financial regulator. I know it doesn't sound that interesting to many of you, I'm sure, but it, it genuinely was. And so I spent six months with the SCA uh, as part of my training. Um, and I guess the, the point there is, is, is you should really know yourself. And if the firm or the place that you're at doesn't necessarily offer what you want on paper, you can always ask the question. I ask the question. It's, you know, it's an intimidating environment being at a law firm surrounded by these partners that have been doing what they've been doing for donkey's years. And yet I took a step out of my comfort zone and asked them to, you know, to curate a training contract that was bespoke and, and relevant for me. And they, they, you know, they allowed me to do that. So I qualified into the white collar crime department of Skadden Arps in the London office uh, and specialised in bribery, corruption, uh, civil and criminal fraud, money laundering, all of the kind of economic financial crimes that often hit the hit the headlines. And that was great. And I was doing that for a couple of years until I kind of realised that. The money didn't motivate me as much as I thought it would at the age of 23 or 24. The glamorous lifestyle, that gets old relatively quickly, at least in my experience. Uh, the late nights, the, the not seeing family. Um, you know, it was a fantastic firm and I don't want to put anyone off pursuing a career in, in that realm and certainly at the firm that I, I was at. But it, 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 it's taxing. Uh, and what I really found was that there was no impact to what I was doing. I was defending um, these alleged perpetrators of these crimes, but I wasn't really making a huge difference to society, to the world, um, improving sustainability, for example. And so I kind of started thinking that there was something maybe I was missing and there was something more out there. And uh, it was per chance, I was on holiday in Berlin, um, a fantastic place to visit if some of you haven't been there already. And there was a former acquaintance of mine from King's who I hadn't spoken to since probably the first year of university, who I had heard on the grapevine had made the transition himself from investment banking to a tech impact startup in Berlin. And so I reached out to him on the off chance that he'd be around when I was there and asked him to go for lunch. We went for lunch. I spoke about what I wasn't, wasn't getting for my current role and what I was potentially looking for and um, understood what his new role was in, the tech, in a tech startup he was working at um, and had a very nice, nice lunch, but didn't think much of it until six months later, uh, he reached out to me and asked whether I was still relatively unhappy in my role, which I replied I was. And 
said that he had moved to a, another startup that was intent on making urban transport more sustainable, which seemed like it was right up my street. And on his recommendation, I had a couple of interviews with um, the founders. It's a very informal process some of the times at a startup. Um, and lo and behold, three weeks later, after a week at Glastonbury, I must, I must admit, um, I was found myself in Berlin in the summer of 2019. Uh, started at a, at a startup, uh, was doing some good work, was really enjoying it. But unfortunately, as is the case with some of the startups that many of us will have the experience of, the startup didn't weather the storm um, that it was in and um, we were all made redundant. So I found myself seven months into my experience in Germany, having been made redundant, wasn't entirely sure what to do, still couldn't speak the local language. Um, and lo and behold, again, as luck would have it, and again, proving the point that your professional networking and your, your um, relationship building is incredibly important, especially early on in your, um, in your career or in your university studies, I was asked to start a startup with a group that had also been made redundant from the same startup who'd heard my name. We started the startup in March 2020, and those who can cast your mind back to then will remember that that is the exact month that the lockdown restrictions um, happened during the pandemic. Uh, we didn't get any investment, that startup failed. I was at a bit of a loss again, uh, and until I finally found myself where I am, um, which is at 1.5, which was started by a King's alumna who reached out to me again, said that she understood that my startup hadn't been successful. She pitched her idea to me. The idea was to effectively replace plastics in packaging and to ensure that we had closed and clean loops in um, sustainable materials uh, and asked me to join 1.5. And I joined there two years ago. The company was three people, the two founders and me when we started and is now 38. So it's grown massively. <clears throat> Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Jack. Really, really interesting to hear about your progression. So, Mike, could you tell us your story and, um, you know, where you began and how you've gotten to where you are now? Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, thanks also, Francine, for bringing us all together today. Um, so I, I started my career um, uh, after graduating from my first degree during a, a, a global economic crisis, so not a dissimilar situation to um, uh, that faced by many of you today. I graduated um, from the University of Surrey in 2008. And, uh, and I, truth be told, I didn't entirely know uh, what I wanted to do. I'd always been interested in a military career, having had a, a godfather who was a, 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 a military officer who'd, who'd been enormously influential on my life. Uh, but I'd also uh, have a, a, a family history um, uh, in Africa and was particularly interested in doing something in the charitable sector in East Africa. Uh, and then the, those two things almost collided and disappeared. And I got offered a, an opportunity to do an unusually long internship with a strategy consultancy, McKinsey uh, and Company, looking at retail and consumer goods, but focused on, on the Middle East and sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and so I, I uh, applied for that opportunity uh, for any of you that are applying for strategy consultancy roles. You know, it's a, a pretty long and uh, arduous process and was uh, delighted uh, when I got the, the role there. Uh, and so I spent the majority of my time in the London office, then then in the West End on German Street. Uh, and then I, I was put on a study that meant I spent six months in uh, living in, in Johannesburg and uh, looking at uh, consumption trends uh, and opportunities for clients across uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which really ticked a lot of boxes uh, for me in terms of my interest in international relations and some of the things that caused uh, 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 market growth. So uh, one of the statistics we used to use a lot was at the time, uh, I think it was 2009 in Nigeria, there were more babies born than in the then uh, 22 EU countries put together. And that was a really exciting uh, uh, soci socio-democratic uh, change, the growth of, uh, of a new generation um, and, and how that linked to the rest of Europe as well. Uh, anyway, the, my time at, uh, at McKinsey uh, came to a, an end and I had uh, in the background been applying to join the army. Uh, and part of that was because it's something, as I said, I, I'd always wanted to do and I, I didn't want it to be something that I said uh, in years to come, oh, I nearly joined the army. Uh, and 
uh, the context is, of course, this is in 2009, 2010, when there is a, 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 a campaign in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, and the army were much more sort of on, in the news and part of society than perhaps we see them today. Uh, and uh, and so I, I went to Sandhurst um, uh, and I commissioned into the British Army uh, and I then spent the next 13 years doing a variety of jobs uh, at regimental duty where my, my regiment was focused on uh, on a reconnaissance role, uh, deploying uh, to Afghanistan and then spending a lot of time uh, working on, on what the military calls staff. Uh, so working for the, the senior general in in London, which involved a, a lot of uh, government affairs, really, um, which which really attracted me, but also strategic level conversations with uh, with politicians um, about conflict resolution. Um, I then I worked in the army headquarters. Uh, I went to Staff College, which is uh, a, a, a sort of um, almost MBA type education, uh, which uh, actually has a link to King's College London, actually, there's a, there's a campus there in Shrivenham. Uh, and it was during that period that I started my master's, um, master's at King's, um, and, uh, and was doing that part time to, to, to my military job, uh, and then got another opportunity to work in Africa and, and moved with my family to Nairobi, uh, where I worked for a cross government organization that was doing capacity building, working with African nations, uh, government, police and military uh, to increase uh, their uh, their capacity and their capability to deliver their roles uh, in their countries. And it really, uh, really appealed to everything that I'm interested in. Um, we did a lot on um, uh, gender equality and inclusion. Inclusion. We did a lot on um, uh, on uh, self defence and protection. Um, not not individual self defence and protection, but but of um, uh, of national borders, um, uh, of anti people trafficking, that sort of stuff. And it was really inspiring. And I had a young family. Uh, have a young family. And then COVID COVID kicked off, uh, and uh, we were evacuated from Kenya, which sounds much more exciting than it was. Uh, and we came back to the UK uh, and I found myself at a bit of a career crossroads. Um, uh, and I was offered another job, which was a really um, uh, uh, sort of a, a job that you aspire to as a, as a military officer to command a, a subunit of soldiers at my regiment. Um, and so I went to go and do that, but still uh, was thinking at the same time that I'd love to give a bit more stability uh, to my family, and I'd had the the fortune of experiencing a transition from one career, from going from McKinsey in the commercial sector to the military, uh, and so uh, whilst daunted, I I understood that a transition from the military, which is a very closed career, I often refer to it as a a, a lone pyramid in the middle of the desert. When you think of most other careers, you're you're in Luxor. There are pyramids everywhere. There's nowhere to jump when you when you leave the army. Um, so it was a little bit daunting, but um, as a family, we made the uh, the decision to leave um, about a year ago. Uh, and there's a formality to these things in the military. So on the first day, I told my commanding officer. On the second day, I told um, the general uh, whom I'd worked closely with uh, out of respect. And then I sort of left a buffer of a few days um, before I, I made the, the final decision to, to to sign my retirement papers. Uh, and it was during that period that I got a message out of the blue from uh, someone on LinkedIn who'd uh, seen that I'd been at King's, uh, who'd seen uh, that I'd worked at McKinsey and seen that I had uh, an interest in defence. And those three things uh, meant that he reached out to me to tell me about a startup that he was involved in uh, that was uh, looking to, that had significant investment and was looking to scale fast to deliver sovereign capabilities uh, within Europe for, for to protect liberal democracies. And it really ticked all of those boxes that um, uh, for me. And uh, so started that process similar to Jack of recruitment in the startup world, which ultimately is a, a lot of very long conversations with um, existing employees and founders uh, and uh, got offered a role in the UK team leading the the land domain. So the, the army uh, work that, that we do. Uh, and I joined, I joined Helsing in June this year, so six months ago, and uh, uh, and it's yeah fast pace and a brilliant place uh, to be when you leave a military career because you feel you're able to have a similar impact 
uh, if not a greater impact, uh, but but without uh, without wearing a uniform. Uh, and what I would say is that there's no way that I'd I'd be here unless I had on my CV uh, that I'd done that that masters at King's. So it would definitely help me get a foot in the door. Thank you for sharing your experience as well, Mike. It's really interesting to hear from both of you and to see how the range of experience that you had kind of informed where you are now and to see it's not kind of a, an immediate jump that it is a bit of a progression really, isn't it? So um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say thank you for, for sharing that, very, very interesting. So it is my turn to share my story. So I guess the thing that you should know about me before I begin is that I am, or I was always very academically driven as a child I just always wanted to prove myself and medicine kind of presented itself as the perfect way to do this. It's very difficult to um, get into medicine. It's not, it's not the easiest thing. And so I really geared myself towards that. I did have an inkling that I would probably enjoy something creative more, <laughs> but in any case, I went for medicine because I had this kind of stereotype in my mind of the starving artist that creatives don't make any money at all. So I was so focused on getting into medical school that I actually completely forgot what the point was of doing that really, which is actually to become a doctor. And I know how silly that sounds, but it was kind of slowly dawning upon me that I would have to actually do this job at some point. And um, I guess when you're very kind of goal driven, sometimes you can get a little bit tunnel visioned really about the kind of greater consequences of what you're doing or what you're studying. Um, and I'll add to that, that if you are quite academic, school can be very comfortable and um, medicine was a lot of school. So I was, I was comfortable in that. But I did find that I was struggling to drum up the same kind of enthusiasm as other people for clinical medicine. And so I wanted to, you know, at least finish medical school and then get a taste of working as a doctor and hopefully find something that I actually enjoyed in doing that really. But I did find that, you know, the three years that I was working as a doctor were very challenging as, as you would expect, but I wasn't able to justify all of the energy and effort and the pressure that I was under because I couldn't feel the kind of core of passion there that, there that other people had. And so at the point when it started to, it would make sense for me to specialize, I decided to take a step back instead and so I decided to go to France to work for six months as a language assistant because I'd been learning French for some years and I thought that might be a nice kind of break for me. And I applied for general practice while I was out there. I also explored my other options as well, other career options with the hope that by the end of the six month period, I'd have an idea of which way I wanted to go. So what I found was that, you know, listening to a lot of podcasts and watching YouTube videos, TEDx kind of talks and things like that were kind of interesting for me to get a different perspective because I was kind of hearing the same advice from other doctors a lot of the time, which was to do general practice and then go part time, even though I knew that wasn't really for me. And something that Jim Carrey said stood out to me. He said that um, he, he gave a commencement speech and he said that you can fail at what you don't want to do. So you might as well take a chance on what you do want to do. And so that kind of thinking got into my head. And I decided when I came back to the UK to apply for a job as a project manager at, at a tech company. And I know that sounds really different and crazy from being a junior doctor, but I was able to see some parallels between those two jobs. And so I would really advise that you see your old job or your current job as a metaphor for your new job. So if you think about it, a junior doctor is really involved in kind of maneuvering and chasing and making sure that all of the right care that the patient needs comes at the right time so that they're able to get better and they can get out of hospital as quickly as possible because it's better for them to get back to their normal lives. And so a project manager does a similar thing, but with projects instead. And so I was able to convince them that they should give me this role at the, at the tech company. So I worked there for about seven months, but I decided to leave because my sister, she um, had just bought a dental practice and she'd also just had a child. So she was needing some help with managing the business side of things. And I thought it would be a great opportunity for me to kind of have some autonomy and get some experience of actually having a business because I'd always wanted to have one. 
And it was the most fulfilled I've ever felt in my life. Honestly, I have never cared so much about a job as I had at that point. Um, and once I got a taste of that, I knew I could never go back. So I loved, I loved the autonomy. I loved the people I worked with. And I enjoyed that I had, you know, um, rain to kind of bring my creative side into, into the role as well. So a big part of my job was to really think about what distinguished us from other people, because there are a lot of dental practices and they were offering similar things. So I realized that our brand was really our competitive, our main competitive advantage. And I had this kind of light bulb moment when I realized that there was a lot that can be done and, you know, in design on a larger scale, everything that I was doing with the practice in terms of the, you know, the design of the space and the online experience, the patient journey to improve people's relationship with healthcare could be done on a larger scale in a range of different healthcare environments. And that's when I decided that I would go to design school. And I often say that I've been looking for an excuse to go to design school because it had been on my mind for some time, but I, I really jumped at it because I saw there was actually a chance for me to bring together my, my background in healthcare and my love of creativity. So, you know, I took a bet for my, on myself. I, I invested in myself in a big way that I had never really done before and it really paid off. And so I, I would say, you know, there are points in your life when you do have to bet on yourself in a way. I'm not a betting person, but you have to, you do have to take a chance upon yourself. And if you see that there is an opportunity to invest in yourself in a big way to, to take you to a whole new kind of environment and give you new opportunities, then it's worth doing. And part of kind of that process of deciding to switch gears again, was really thinking in a bigger way or imagining bigger things for myself. And I love design, but I also love speaking and sharing my, my opinions and my perspectives on things because I know that there's a lot that I've learned since leaving the beaten path of medicine that would have been helpful to me while I was still on it. So I decided to start a podcast. Um, it's called Brand New Doctor. And I talk to you know people who are still in medicine but have done something differently, who think differently and are doing kind of a project or they have a brand of their own. And I really want to share those kind of insights that you maybe don't necessarily get when you're on the, the course, because everyone gets the same degree. But if you are able to think in a slightly different way, you can achieve something different. And so, um, so yeah, that's kind of my story where I am up to right now. I'm working as a graphic designer, and I'm also building up my kind of client work in the healthcare space, working with doctors and dentists. So, um, so now it is time to share some of our, our tips. And um, I know that we, we've kind of talked about everyone's kind of story and the way that they've transitioned, but I wonder if Jack, you could be, begin by telling us some of your specific tips for changing career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, thank you very much for, for that, Ravaki, as well. But I think um, I want to pick up on two of the points you just raised, which which actually fit comfortably with, um, um, perfectly, not comfortably, sorry, perfectly with what I was going to say, which is you said taking chances and also caring about the job or and, and the brand um, that you are promoting. Uh, and these often people take for granted. Um, you know, when I was looking to be more impactful, uh, I was in a career that, yes, it was prestigious. And yes, people thought, wow, it's amazing that you're a lawyer. Just like, you know, it's amazing you're in the army or it's amazing that you're a doctor. But if you don't um, care about the, the job that you're in um, and, and care about the image, the brand image that you're promoting, that you're intending to promote, then um, you're not going to have a good time at work and your happiness and mental health are what's far more important than any, anyone else's opinions of you. Um, so I guess, I mean, one of the questions that was, was posed to me before the, 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 this webinar was, what, is it, what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? But I sort of retort with what is what is what is it to have entrepreneurial spirit right how do you go out into the world and start a business or join a startup with knowing very little about the industry or with knowing very little about the the, the fellow uh, the business area or, or or your fellow colleagues but it's all about 
pursuing all of life's opportunities, which kind of ties in with you you saying, Malaki, about taking chances. Um, life will show throw many opportunities at you. It's all about understanding how to distill the right opportunities for you from the wrong ones. But part of that is taking a chance, taking risk, understanding that you can change your life for the better. Some things don't always work out, um, but it's having that self-confidence and that trust. And that's all part of having that entrepreneurial spirit. It's trying something new. It's being inquisitive. It's asking questions. I very much don't care about looking silly in a meeting or at a presentation and asking questions because if I don't understand something, first and foremost, I'm confident in my own ability. I'm not trying to impress anybody there, but also I'm pretty damn sure that someone else doesn't understand what I'm going to ask, or at least I would hope, unless I've got it completely wrong right, um, and I'm doing someone else in the room a favor. And that's very much what you should do as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I, I said I left my career in, in the law because it wasn't impactful enough. I wasn't doing something for the greater good. Uh, and it was and it's necessarily having that spirit and that ambition that really drives you and at least drove me to to working in the three different, very different startups that I've since worked in um, since moving to Germany. Um, business is founded on relationships. Uh, the, another point I wanted to add, uh, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, you know, a contract that you want to sign, some investment investment you're trying to get, that's all based on your interactions with, with other human beings. Now, you need to start building those relationships or at least attempting to build those relationships as early on as possible, but also not just with your course mates. It's not just enshrouded in, in academia. I had a part time job at university. I played rugby at university. I had friends outside of Kings, believe it or not, if I had the time for that. You know, all of these relationships are incredibly important. And when you transition into a new career, having that backup and having those people that can you can speak to and you can um, they who've potentially gone through the same experiences as you, who are in the same industry as you, because you've got a broad network of individuals that you can rely on, that's an incredibly important support network. Um, you know, and as I said, being able to switch careers is is, is having that that ability to self reflect understand that where you are at the moment isn't necessarily where you want to be, but taking the taking the sort of wheel, taking um, the advantages that are thrown at you and really making that change because no one's gonna do it for you. No one was gonna come to me and say, you know, Jack, being a lawyer isn't for you. Have you thought about going into a tech or sustainability startup? No one was gonna say that to me, right? That was based on me making that decision myself. You have to look at the world in a little bit of an opt uh, a pessimistic view. People are out for themselves. They're not necessarily out for you. And I'm not saying that there aren't altruistic people out there. Of course there are. I hope many of us who are joining the webinar today are, but you should not be frightened of being a little bit more selfish and, and having that confidence and saying, this isn't right for me. It doesn't matter what my parents think. It doesn't matter what my, my comrades or my or my um, my um, work colleagues think. This is about doing what's right for me and 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 doing something that's going to make me feel better and happier in in, in my role. Yeah, I think those are some really 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 important tips, really helpful tips. So thank you for that. I will share some of my tips. So I I think that the most helpful thing for me very early on was actually realizing that I needed new role models. You need to be actually a little bit selective about who you ask for advice. Um, if you are in the same you know, echo chamber of people, you're gonna get the same advice over and over again. So I was working in medicine and asking other doctors what they thought about changing career away from medicine. Of course, they're gonna tell me that I should stay and maybe think about dialing it back a little bit, you know, just uh, kind of coming to some kind of compromise that would still require me to do something that I really didn't have a passion for. And so it was really helpful to me to talk to my sister. Uh, she was a role model to me because she still is really, she's kind of a mentor to me because she um, had also done something kind of unconventional for, um, you know, coming from a Nigerian household of studying law and then not actually becoming a lawyer. She went into um, marketing and now works in social media. She's a consultant in social media. So she gave me this very, very, you know, helpful advice, which, is my second point, which is to really think about just what the next best step is. You don't have to have a five-year plan when you're thinking about changing career. It is difficult, you know, even if you are on a path like medicine where they say you do this and then you do this and you do this, they've, you know, kind of clearly defined the hoops for you to jump through. It is even difficult there to predict the future. Things change, life 
changes you might feel differently but it's even more difficult if you are kind of embarking on a new career path you have to carve a path for yourself you're not just following one and so you kind of have to get comfortable with the idea that you're not going to be able to predict the future, but you can just decide what the next best step is for you and trust that by just deciding what the next best step is, you will eventually end up where you want to go to. And I know that has worked really well for me because I could not have predicted four years ago when I decided to leave medicine that I would be where I am today. It seems perfectly clear to me now, obviously with hindsight because of everything I know about myself, but it wasn't clear at the time. I just had to trust that it would it would work out. So yeah, that's my advice. Find new role models and just decide what the next best step is. So um, on to you, Mike. What are your tips for changing career? Thanks, um, Rilaki. Yeah, I think um, yeah, some really good tips from everyone there. Um, uh, and I just um, uh, sort of bring the two together, actually, and what, what I call call the mission. I think uh, I, I think considering transition or starting a new career in, in two elements, theory and practice, but first of all, on the theory, um, you'll, you, you'll be influenced by a whole host of factors. It might be remuneration, it might be family, it might be travel and work-life balance, it might be um, stress. Um, and it's worth considering which of these factors are the most important to you, weighing them in priority, and then assessing those against possible career options. Uh, I, I suppose I would give a warning. I nearly left the army in, uh, and uh, earlier in my career in 2015 and got offered an incredible job at an investment bank. Uh, and there's something about pride in when you when you sit at a, at a dinner party and someone says, hey, what do you do? And you say, I'm an army officer. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. And there's, you know, you sit up straight and they sit up and they listen to you. And I was, you know, similarly, being offered a job in investment banking and say I'm an investment banker and and, and the re- remuneration package that comes with that is attractive. I'd say that the, the number one lesson for me is uh, is you've got to believe in your mission and it can't be shallow water like uh, making money. There's got to be uh, got to be more depth to it. Um, the second bit on practice uh, and and sort of finding how you then find what's right for you um, your your mission. Uh, for me, um, when when considering it from a transition perspective, one career to another, uh, my top advice is have a lot of coffees. Uh, and when you go for those coffees, keep an open mind uh, and bring an open notebook. Never ever leave those uh, those encounters without at least two further introductions, two further coffee dates with other people, and always follow up with a thank you uh, and therefore uh, an opportunity to, to give a re- reminder of the uh, introduction she's been promised. And then I think, if I may, having made that transition or started your your new career, a few tips just for settling in uh, uh, for a new job. And and again, to reiterate what the other two have said is that everyone, everyone has imposter syndrome at, at some point. And so you're not unique if you're sitting there thinking that that uh, you know you're the lemon in the room who doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, I guarantee 99% of the time, your own imposter syndrome is unfounded. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there. Secondly, I'd say Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, once you found your USP or whatever your killer contribution is, focusing focus on delivering that consistently over time. And don't, don't be discouraged if the world doesn't change in, in just a day. And then the other thing I'd say for those who, whether you've come from a previous career moving to a new career or you've come from previous experiences moving to something new however polarized in terms of output or value proposition uh your previous job and your your next job might might feel there are bound to be lessons from your previous career your previous experience that can be applied to your new one even even without your necessarily knowing that uh, and, and so an example I give is that in my last job in the army, I tried to set a, I, I was in a leadership position. So I had sort of control of an organization and a whole bunch of people. And so it was the responsibility of my, maybe my only responsibility was to set a culture. And so I based that on three basic principles, professionalism and performance. You know, we're all, you know, we're being, all got to be professional about what we do we're here to deliver an output uh, uh, to a high standard. Creativity and innovation, good ideas. Uh, 
aren't the preserve of the highest paid person or the person that, that, that's been there the longest. So you've got to speak up if you've got a novel approach, but importantly, be willing to listen, uh, not necessarily implement, but at least listen um, to to others' good ideas. And then thirdly was kindness and respectfulness, which which goes without saying. And so those are just those are three examples that were really specific to the military context, but are just equally uh, applicable in, in the commercial world. Thank you. So there you have it, some, some really practical tips. And so before we open questions up to the floor, can we each just share a positive note about your career, about our career changes? So um, if you would like to begin, Jack. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Um, I think so going back to um, ensuring that you, uh, you are happy in your role and you preserve your mental health, which is by all means the most important thing uh certainly in my opinion i think it's well documented as well that that's certainly what you should be looking for in in, in a career um i um as, as i said previously i transitioned to a new role about two years ago um at 1.5 where i worked for the first 18 months or so as legal and platform operations lead um we we just raised a a, a large seed round um we made a load of um offers to new recruits and the, those of us who'd been there some time, of course, I was employee number one, were offered promotions. This was back in April this year. Um, and after some consideration and looking at the promotion, uh, although it came with far better share stock options and far better salary, uh, I realized it wasn't what I wanted to do. I, mean, I, I didn't move to a startup for a salary. If I was only hell bent on a salary, I would have stayed in the corporate world. Um, I really wasn't interested in the work that I thought the job description would entail. Uh, and I also thought that um, I, you know, I'm there to learn and I wouldn't be learning if I was continuing with my with my legal work because I've been doing that stuff for the past five or six years. I wanted to try something new. So I declined the, the promotion, which is a big step and it takes a lot of confidence. Um, but I think it's exactly that. And, and Mike's just hit on the imposter syndrome part of which we all very much suffer from. I had many conversations with, with my peers and with friends saying, you know, who do I think I am? They're offering me a, a more money. They're offering me a promotion to a head off position. Um, you know who do I think I am de declining that but you know the outcome was you know be confident in yourself and I was confident in myself I knew I'd help build up the team I knew that I was an integral part of of the organization they were building and I knew the role wasn't right for me and those three things are huge red flags um but ultimately I also kind of knew that they would come back to me because of how integral I was to the team and because of the skills I brought. Um, and so ultimately four or five months later, uh, the founders came back to me with a completely different role, uh, same salary on offers before. Um, and the, the role really was exactly what I wanted it to be. And, and I accepted. So I guess the, 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 the end point for me would be is trust yourself, trust what you believe in, know what you set out to do when you're changing careers. I set out to learn something completely different from the law. I didn't want to be sidelined and, and, and pigeonholed as a lawyer and therefore have that self-confidence to ask questions and to decline things that you don't want to do. Yeah, I think I think that is um, that's really powerful. It's interesting as well listening to you know what you were remembering what you were saying earlier about kind of going along with the flow with everyone else, and now this is a point when you're you know um, you know older and wiser and more confident in what you want. Uh, it's easier. It's not easier, but you're you have your convictions about what is right for you, and I think that maybe that just develops a little bit with time. So we have to be patient with ourselves, I guess. Um, okay, so. Mike, would you like to share a little bit of what you has, what you find positive about your career change? Yeah, um, thanks. I love that that last point that you've just given there. Um, I think I keep it really simple. Um, uh, uh, sort of sort of closing top tips. Um, one would be uh, take initiative. Um, you know, Jack made a point earlier about like, people aren't necessarily going to going to look after you. You've got to look after yourself and. Uh, and yeah, you do that by taking initiative. That is made easier when you believe in the mission. Um, uh, but you might have to find yourself reminding yourself of of why you're there, and that and that's the mission. Because yeah, there are inevitably tough days, particularly in startups uh, that that don't always uh, don't always grow as, as as they were hoped to grow. So remind yourself of the mission. Let let that um, uh, let that spur you on. And then finally, I'd just say, and perhaps reiterating a message from both the other uh, panel members is that you know, be, be, be kind to yourself, 
uh, and and be be kind to one another look after your, your mental health and that of others yeah it, it goes to that same but the world's changed enormously even in the sort of relatively short period of time that i've been in the working world uh, and it kindness costs nothing um and and it and it goes both ways but um you know it starts by starts by showing showing an example and and i think you know you'll find that actually yeah, people want to be kind to you as well. And that sort of loops back to the first point of taking initiative. People reach out to people, ask them to help, for help where you need it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think my my point is probably quite similar in it, or that I see some kind of, um, I see a relationship with what I would, what I want to share really. Um, my point, my positive note is just really realizing over the last kind of couple of years that, extraordinary actions lead to extraordinary results so I was reading I can't completely take credit for this I've kind of switched it around a little bit but I was reading a, um, an interesting book um, by someone called Ramit Sethi and he was talking about you know repeating the same action and getting the same result and he said ordinary actions lead to ordinary results and on reading this I, I really felt that it's true you kind of have to take initiative and I could see in my life that when I had taken an initiative and I hadn't waited for someone to tell me that now was the right time to do this or now is the right time to do that. And I decided to take a risk by myself. I saw a, a completely different result. I saw greater results. So I, I would say sometimes you just need to do something a little bit different. And if you can take a bigger risk or take a bigger leap, let's say, um, you will see bigger results. And generally speaking they are positive if you take a calculated risk so that's my that's my added positive note for everyone so um, now we are going to open the floor to some questions and I think that we have one already so um, there's a question from Jack who is asking um, Oh, sorry, it's a question I think is relating possibly, maybe Jack, you might want to answer this first of all. When you're navigate, navigating a new career, should you accept potential dips in salary and what seems to be smart and what's not such a smart choice to make when it comes to these kind of salary dips? Yeah, I'm happy to take a stab at that um, first, Valaki, but I think, uh, you know, you've always got to be smart. Um, you wouldn't want to put yourself in a situation where you were struggling financially. Um, but, uh, you know, when I when I was looking into a career in law, the remuneration package was a big draw for me as a young 20 something um, year old who, who, you know, had come from a small market town and town in the middle of nowhere. And I think the, the 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 older I got and the more I realized that my priorities had shifted and that it was less about potentially money and recognition and more about being impactful um, that led me to take and I did I take a huge salary cut when I'm, I'm sure um, you know the other panel members have similar stories um, but I followed something that I knew was going to make me happier and enrich me in other ways that money wouldn't be able to and so that to me didn't seem like it was such an issue then after that salary cut I started my own startup and didn't pay myself a salary for an entire year so you know I went from a corporate law salary to, to nothing in, in the space of 18 months which is which is a huge drop and I wouldn't advise that you know I, I was very lucky to have had savings and I was able to make that shift but to answer the question I think it would be silly to do it if it meant that you then had to rely on other people for um it, financially as long as you're in a position where you're able to support yourself and maybe your dependents and you're able to live a lifestyle that you want you don't necessarily then need the additional disposable income to to show off to friends or to do to, you know, to go on lavish holidays or to go to lavish places if that's not you do what do what do what you do what you enjoy and make sure that you're happy doing it and that that really is the most important thing for me anyway I reprioritize and found that out when I was about 28 29 but hopefully some of you can find that out a bit, bit earlier in life, perhaps. Yeah, I think that I think that is really um really sound advice. What well, I um I can share my, my experience of this. Um, when I decided I would go to design school, I had to um really save money. I had to knuckle down and save some money. First of all, I knew I would be paying quite a lot of money for design school, but also for the three month period that I would be there, which is an intensive course. I would also not be able to work. So um, I really had to decide in my mind, like, how important is this to me, <laughs> first of all? And what sacrifices was I, was I willing to make to make that happen, really? Um, I would say 
it's true that you, you know, you can take a, a salary cut because, you know, there is fulfillment outside of money. Um, you just need to be able to cover your kind of basic costs, the things that you need to um, afford in your life. And once you've got that kind of covered, then you will feel freer to make these kinds of decisions. Um, but, you know, going back to my earlier point, it is helpful to just bear in mind if that is a decision that you've made, that you are very clear on why you're making that decision. So, um, Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I, probably not. I'm not sure how helpful it is, but partly mm -hmm. because uh, moving from the public sector to the private sector, uh, you, you're generally going to take a, a, an increase in salary rather than the decrease. I mean, high, highly unlikely you'd take a decrease at, at the level I transitioned. But it, it does go back to the point that everyone's made that if you, you know, obviously you, you've got to be able to, to make ends meet and, and sort of satisfy your, your basic needs. But if believing in the mission is going to be more important ultimately, or believing in what you're doing, than the, the the big paycheck and the house and the car and whatever else that that, that comes with that, uh, and so obviously you have to make your own decisions. You have to weigh up uh, what are these you need, what are these that you you want. Uh, but I wouldn't get so um, so fixated with uh, you know with with the paycheck because it'll come as well if you make a success of it, it'll come. The other thing I'd say is that you you know inevitably there might be a a case where you make a career transition and actually i saw one of the other questions is that you know if you, you're moving from one professional sphere to another you find yourself competing with people who are more experienced with you in that particular career stream um and so it might be that you um uh, are going in at a level trajectory rather than going in on a promotion and therefore you're either there's parity of salary from where you're coming from or, or you're potentially even taking a small salary job I, I, one way of seeing that is the the the, the tax on uh, a career transition that is worth it for all the reasons that you've discovered in advance, whether it's mental health or just like your passion of uh, of moving from you know, being a medic to being something more creative, and therefore it's a it's a tax that's worth paying. But again, I go back to the same point: is that you 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 won't need to worry about that salary drop before you know it. You'll you'll be on parity with what you're earning before and. Uh, and more generally, particularly if you're you're good at what you're doing, unless you're, of course, making the leap in the opposite direction to that which I did and going into the public sector, then um, you you may not uh, be guaranteed. But um, on the whole, I really wouldn't wouldn't worry about it. It's a short short term problem, uh, nor a medium or long term one. Okay, so another another question for us is: What are the challenges that relate to skills, knowledge, and past experience when it comes to being accepted in a totally new career? Um, I can I can start by answering this question. I think that um, it is. I think it is helpful like I said, to really see the job that you have currently as a metaphor for the new job that you want to go into and to look for those parallels. Because oftentimes the biggest challenge is actually just convincing someone that they should give you the role. A lot of the time when you get there, you will figure it out. There isn't any kind of, there, there are so many roles out there that have so many like overla overlapping transferable skills between them. And you have to, um, you know, break down that job really to its simplest elements a lot of the time. So I wouldn't worry about once you get there, because you will, generally speaking, you will be able to figure it out. If it's a similar level of seniority that you're applying for, you'll be able to figure it out. But just figure out how to convince them to give you that opportunity in the first place and do that by finding the parallels between your current job and your new job. So um, Jack or Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Nothing at all. I think that was very sage advice. Um, figure it out. That's what everyone's doing day to day themselves. So you'll you'll get there. You've a sound sound grounding of a king's education. So uh, you'll be fine. Yeah. So next question: For people who are not necessarily satisfied in their current career options, but don't know where to go next, what advice would you have? Okay. So um, Mike or Jack, would you like to jump in? Yeah. Sure. I, I, I'll I'll go first. Um, I, I think um, I think job um, job satisfaction is obviously really important, and I, and I think it's you know we're always it's probably exploring a little bit. Certainly, my thirteen years in the army, I, I did an assessment every year if it was right 
to carry on in the army or not. And I appreciate that's a relatively unusual um, environment within which to work and not every job uh, uh, comes with the risk of being deployed somewhere dangerous for six months. So it's natural to think about uh, about moving on. Um, I think, uh, but I think having a curious mind is no no bad thing. And I think that's probably the start place is like be curious um, and, and be aware, be alert um, as to what other opportunities are out there. I think seeing what other people are doing, and I think, you know, there, there are yeah, hopefully some few examples today of re relatively radical career transitions um, that show the art of the possible that should encourage people, not uh, not overwhelm them, because generally, I think career transitions aren't necessarily as, as, as radical as you know, medicine to, to to creative arts is like that's awesome and that's uh, and that's so exciting and you know often you'll find that uh, um, uh, you know a bit more like like mine that's maybe a bit more boring uh, going from army to going to work in in a defense startup is uh, is a bit more of a gentle transition and then the third thing I'd say is is, is back to my top tip is uh, for me, for me, the best place to start once you've done your sort of research and your observations is have a lot of coffee. People are really willing to talk, um, and they're really willing to to share, and they're really willing to help. And particularly if they've got a connection, whether it's uh, that you're a, you're a King's graduate, or, uh, or or whether you've worked with them before, or or you work in a similar industry, you'd be amazed how many people are willing to spend half an hour in their day uh, to have a coffee. It gives them a break from the office. So have a lot of coffees, uh, uh, learn a lot through you know, Jack's point earlier, you know, all boils down to relationships. And Jack, do you have anything to add to that? Um, you, I mean, you, you know yourself best and you will know what you're not satisfied with um, in terms of your current career. And so I guess work backwards, uh, you know, synthesize what you're not happy with and understand what potentially then would make you happy in a career. There's nothing wrong with taking pen to paper, writing down three or four bullet points. It's exactly what I did when I rejected my first promotion at my, at my current role. Write down three or four bullet points, try and understand what it is that you want from a career, what would make you satisfied, um, and then start to talk, you know, as Mike said, have those coffee dates. Um, you know, I ended up moving to Berlin after a, a lunch I thought nothing of, you know, three years prior. Um, have those conversations with people because people will be able to understand from what you've said as to what would make you more satisfied and happy in a job. Um, but I think, you know, it's 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 all it's all about, I mean, make use of, I mean, the case sale um, careers advisors are a fantastic start, actually. Uh, you know, I made certainly made use of them when I was toying with the career choices that I was trying to make as a, as a student and trying to understand where I positioned myself after graduation. But there are various different avenues for you to follow. Um, but ask questions, engage with other individuals. Um, I really liked your point uh, earlier, Alaki, actually, that about um, not, not necessarily um, speaking with people in the same echo chamber as you, which is something I've not really thought about so much myself, but that's a very incredible incredibly powerful point because if you speak to people who are from similar backgrounds to you in similar careers who have made similar choices well the likelihood is that they're going to give you advice that you've already heard yourself or you already said to yourself it's all about expanding your horizons and speaking to different people partly why I said at the beginning I like languages you expand your horizons and speak to different people from different cultures have a different understanding of the world and how they see it and hopefully that would influence you and make sure that you find what could satisfy you you might not know what satisfies you yet you don't know what every role entails right you can't know that no one does but you enter into a job and you you, you make it work and you mold that yourself I think that's a, an incredibly powerful tool yeah I, I completely agree with you as well Jack I would say that it is a bit of a process of experimentation really um I think that there are I look at back at my Kind of career change. I know at the start there was kind of a period of deliberation, then I kind of moved into exploring, and then I moved into a period of just experimenting a little bit. And I think that the more that you are able to expose yourself to different kind of ideas, um, different ways of working, and the more you're able to kind of make connections and just see what kind of resonates with you. And so I'm not saying that you need to get you know, a different job every five minutes and test out everything. But there are different ways of doing that. You can just do your research about it online. You can talk to people. And I would say, you know, add to your experimentation a bit of self-reflection as well as to, you know, what have you enjoyed in the past? 
uh, like I said, with my story, I had an inkling quite early on that I actually wanted to do something creative and I just ignored that intuition. I think it is quite difficult to listen to our intuition because it's very inconvenient a lot of the time to do this. But if you can try and spend a bit more time actually just listening to yourself. I don't want to sound woo-woo or anything, but the more time you spend listening to yourself, the more it will pay off because you either kind of listen to it, listen to your intuition now, or you listen to it later when when you wish you would have acted on it earlier. Um, so maybe just give yourself a little bit more credit that you might have more answers than you realize that you do already. Um, so the next question is actually for Jack. Specifically, as this person says, as a recent law graduate who is due to start her training contract, I was wondering how difficult it is to change careers after qualifying as a solicitor. Can experience gained at a corporate law firm help in getting offers in the business field? What is the best time to switch careers as a young lawyer? Is it right after TC? I guess that's the training contract or two to three years post qualifications or later? Uh Thanks. I just very, very conscious of time. Um, I think I'll just be very brief here and say, um, you know, King's graduate, a solicitor, there is a presumption of intelligence and academic excellence that you have sorted. It's those transferable skills that you learn um, doing extracurricular activities and everything else, which will make it far, which will make you a far more valuable and exciting candidate for a potential position changing roles. Um, can experience from a global help in getting offers? Yes, of course it can. Team working, client uh, management skills, problem solving, etc. All these transferable skills are incredibly uh, important for any career, and that's something that you should really take hold of and understand very early on. It's it's the academic intelligence and 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 the training can come. Everyone can learn on the job, but it's having those skills that are incredibly important. When's the best time to switch? When when you're when you're not happy, when you when you when you, you'll feel it in yourself, you'll know innately that you're not not in the right position and not in the right place. And it's the people that ignore those that intuition that like I just said are the people that actually find themselves in incredibly unhappy and stressful situations. Yeah, that is very, very helpful. Thank you both so much. We are um, kind of drawing to the end of this. So just to wrap up, we just have one question to ask to everyone. What have you learned about yourself in the process of changing careers? So Mike, would you like to begin? Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that by quoting you, Rolaki, because I thought you said it really beautifully there. Um, you probably have more of the answers to the questions already than, than you, you think. Uh, and if you don't have those already, then you absolutely uh, will work that out through that transition process. And you'll realize you, that you do, you, you know more uh, than you think you know. And a lot of that uh, process is, is affirmatory um, rather than, than discovery. Very helpful. And Jack, how about you? I guess potentially flipping that on its head, um, people don't know what you don't know uh, unless you tell them. And so it's all about everyone's there to learn. Every day is a learning day. Every day is a training day. If you are, um, if you're committed, uh, you're a good employee and you ask the right questions, there is no reason whatsoever that you should feel that you have any kind of imposter syndrome because you don't know the answer or you don't know what to do straight away. There's no blueprint for a new role, just like there's no blueprint for, for life, but you can learn that. You have, you're equipped with the, with the intelligence and the opportunities to be able to, to learn. So, so take, make the most of that. I certainly did. I went from a law firm to a startup with no idea how it functioned. And three years later, you know, I'm still in startups and, and we're having relative success. Amazing. Okay, so what I would what I would say, what I've learned about myself, is really that um, you know the the biggest limitation to um, actually achieving anything is really my imagination. I feel, I think that I've looked back at my career and I've realized that everything that I thought I could get, I did, and so I I think that it's possible to kind of push further to where you actually want to go. I would say, when you are thinking about changing careers, basically instead of thinking about what you think is reasonable or achievable, really start with what you want to actually do. And um, I think my career has just been a process of convincing myself that I deserved to do what I wanted to do. And you absolutely do deserve to do what you want to do. So aim high and you will get there. You just need to apply your attention to it. The more attention you apply to something, the more it improves. So just apply your attention to what you actually do want. And so I think that's everything for me. I'll hand it back over to Francine. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you all for this webinar. Um, you've given your time and I know you're extremely busy. So a huge thank you again to, to you all. Um, I'm sorry that we were unable to uh, respond to all of the questions you had, but do feel free to reach out to our speakers on the Kings Connect. Um, you can also use Kings Connect um, to make sure that you um, find other alumni who are working in jobs and feel that you are interested in. Um, so do have a look at the chat, I shared the link there. Um, also wanted to mention that if you're interested in learning more about your career options, you can use the careers and employability services, which you continue to be eligible for up to two years after you graduate. Um, and King's Careers also have uh, excellent career support for career changes. Um, which I've also linked it on the chat. Um, if you have any questions about what was shared today, do not hesitate to get in touch with the alumni office by emailing us at forever at kcl.ac.uk, also through our social media channels at KCL Alumni. Um, and if you'd like to share this webinar with your networks, don't forget to use the hashtag foreverkings. Uh, once again, thank you very much to our wonderful panelists for joining us today, and thank you all for listening. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. This has been great. Thanks, guys. Bye.